in a lot of situations, what we're trying to achieve in Western style woodworking is that just so fit between two complementary parts. And the basic building block of all Western woodworking is going to be the ubiquitous mortise and tenon joint, whether we're talking about aprons and rails on a table or a chair, or we're talking about a bridle joint and slip fit on a tenon when we're doing a breadboard in on a tabletop. There's many situations where you've got to remove just a few thousandths of an inch to try to achieve that perfect little compression fit. The shoulder plane is the tool of choice in this situation because it's the best alternative outside of some very complicated numerically controlled routers that you can use to remove just a few thousandths of an inch to achieve that fit. I'm going to give you an example of how we achieve that just so fit using a shoulder plane on the end of this walnut stretcher for this small side table. Uh, all hand planes, whether they're shoulder planes or standard planes, are like good saws. They're all self-jigging tools, meaning that if we have the fore end of the tool, the middle of the tool, and the aft end of the tool in good intimate contact with the cheeks of that tenon, we can take a controlled shaving all the way across the length of that tenon. Just like using a standard plane, when we enter the cut, we want to have enough, enough downward bias that we're going to make good, in, good contact with the cutting element, but most of your downward pressure is going to be in the fore end of the tool. As we approach the center of cut, you have about equal pressure between the front hand and the back hand, and as we exit the cut, you want to transition the majority of your downward pressure to the rear hand. In, in very few situations in the use of the shoulder plane are you going to be doing along the grain types of cuts. The nature of the tool is to trim the cheeks closer together to fit inside of a mortise and to trim the shoulders to get a good light tight fit perpendicular or whatever angle you want in relation to the vertical members. Those cuts are always against the grain. You've got with the grain cuts and against the grain cuts and I wanted to show you one of the hazards of just this type of cut. I'm going to put my walnut stretcher aside since it's going to be going into my actual project. I'm going to use this piece of white oak to demonstrate the kind of blowout that can happen and then hopefully give you a little bit of coaching on how to eliminate that. And spelt is basically going to be a situation where you have just a little uncontrolled blowout on the very exit side of your tool where you can, or your material, where you can least afford it. L let me show you some of the things you can do to avoid that uncontrolled blowout. You can use a hard block of wood with a piece of sandpaper or a finely set shoulder plane. But my tool of choice for doing this next part is a sharp chisel. And what we got to do is we got to pay attention to three areas. You've got the uh, shoulder of the tenon where it meets the edge of the stock that the tenon's milled into right here you're going to have the apex between the edge of the tenon and the cheek of the tenon right on this corner here and then you're going to have the end of the tenon which corresponds to the end of the board where the edge and the end come together right here and what we do is we just simply take a chisel or a fine cutting rasp or woodworking file and we're just going to back bevel that a little bit, just a little bit of a chamfer. That wood directly adjacent to that edge when chamfered like that will support that cut when it exits and control that blowout to a large degree. One more here on the edge. That'll also help when we're trying to ease that tenon into the mortise. And then the last one be right here along the grain going back to the shoulder of the tenon just like that. Well, the, the final step to getting that just so fit between the mortise and the tenon uh, is where the shoulder plane earns its keep. What I've got left here on my little side table is one more joint where we're going to fit this tenon into that mortise and as you can see here, our tenon, as it came off the machines, is slightly too thick and slightly too wide to fit into its intended mortise. And this is really where the shoulder plane earns its keep. We just have to remove a few thousandths of an inch of material from this cheek, a few thousand from this cheek, and perhaps a little bit from the short edges to get that just so fit in between these two parts. Uh, the better quality shoulder plane manufacturers will supply with a blade that is just just a skosh wider than the sole of the tool. In this case, it's probably 80 thousandths of an inch wider. And the reason we do that is because depending upon whether you have the tool with 
the blade set to the right or to the left, it's going to allow you to cut directly to the inside corners of the cheeks and the, tenon, the, 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 cheeks and the shoulders of the tenons, uh, making sure that you don't leave a ridge of wood that'll interfere with your final fit. In this situation, I've already got my piece of walnut apron stock clamped into the vise, and I've got to remove just a little bit of material on the cheek of this left side tenon, so I've got the blade of the tool sticking, just like I said, a hair's breadth to the left side of the tool, just proud enough to make sure that we don't leave a ridge of wood in between the shoulder and the cheeks of this tenon. And now I'm going to take a couple of test strokes, adjust my depth of cut until I'm removing the desired amount of material, and that looks about right. The planing is, is pretty straightforward. The only thing to be mindful of is that in situations where the tenon length is greater than the width of the sole of your tool, you're going to have to take one cut near the shoulder and then move the cut away from the shoulder for the second pass, then back near the shoulder and alternate like that so that you don't end up with a wedge and you actually end up with a tenon that has good flat geometry. In some situations where you've carefully prepared the uh, exit sides of your stock, you might still experience a little bit of unwanted blowout. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not against the rules to uh, reverse the uh, planing action of your tool and attack it from the far side toward the middle while you're doing it from the near side toward the middle on this side. You still want to be careful to make sure that you overlap your strokes, paying careful attention to this inside apex where the shoulder and the cheeks of the tendon meet. Very, very easy to get lulled into the, removing too much stock on the exit side of the tendon, creating a wedge rather than a tendon that has good regular geometry. It's a pretty close fit at this point. Maybe another couple of strokes. Let's check this fit one more time. Make sure our part or is oriented properly. Ah, that's perfect. Just like that. One last dry fit to make sure that everything fits just right. Prep these surface for sanding, and uh, I think we're ready for a tabletop.